What we are going to do now is to have a look at how the Gospels are the teaching of Jesus. So I hope we understand the question. We know the Gospels are oh, an account of the life and the teaching and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But in what way are they an account? Because let's, let's face it, the Gospels are not autobiography. Jesus himself did not write anything. So what are the Gospels then? Uh, how should we think about what the Gospels are? And the first thing is, the Gospels are not a historical novel. A good historical novel can give you, you know, a great insight into the politics of a certain age. And you know, if it is a well-researched historical novel, you will learn all sorts of things about trade and about customs, etc. It can be really very absorbing. But in the end, an historical novel is not history. Now, the Gospels are not an historical novel. Even though they give us lots of the politics and the interesting bits, etc., of those age, the Gospels claim to be a reflection of things that actually happened. So the Gospels are history. And we're going to think about how the Gospels are history. And we should start with a brief history of the early church. First, we get the actual historical event. So Jesus was on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. He was sitting on the hillside and teaching there. It is the actual historical event. But an historical event is gone once it has happened. The only way how an historical event is accessible after it happened is through memory, is through other material remains of that uh, event. I mean, history, it's there and it's immediately gone. Even this talk here, what will be the evidence how it actually happened? It will be your memory, it will be the recordings that have been made, but nobody will in the future be able to take a chair here and sit in. You can't go back in time. The event itself becomes physically unaccessible. So we have the actual historical event. Then we get the teaching of the historical event. And that is what the apostles were doing right after Pentecost. So we're going to have a look at it. So the teaching, well, the event was inaccessible, but we get the teaching of the historical event. Then, in the course of uh, church history, in sort of talking about the 40s and the 50s of the first century AD, um, the apostles start to write letters. So we have them teaching the historical event and writing letters to the churches at the same time. Then we go one stage further and we get the preaching of the apostles, we get the letter writing and also the gospels are written down. But what do they write down? What do the gospel writers write down? That is then the big question. But one step further, then we get to the second generation, the memory of the teaching of the apostles. But those, that generation dies out, and all we are left is with the copying of the letters and the copying of the gospels. So that's a sort of short history of the early church. And all we have now is the copying of that. Um, so, teaching. The apostles start to teach, and that is so obvious, but it is important to emphasize. So we get in, in Acts 2, um, now they devoted themselves, the early church, to the apostles' teaching. We get it in Acts 5. They did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, uh, Jesus is the Christ. In Acts 15, um, in, Paul remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Here it is almost suggestive that it is kind of a circumscribed body of, uh, of teaching there. In Acts 18, he stayed a year and six months in Corinth, teaching the word of God among them. The apostles were teaching. 
the thing. That was the first thing. Now, then we get to the stage where the teaching and the letter writing is side by side. And Corinthians is a very good example of it. Paul wrote Corinthians around the year 54 or 55 AD. We can sort of date it reasonably exactly. Um, and Paul writes to the church this. I commend you, finally, Corinthians are commended for something, that, uh, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions as I delivered them to you. That's interesting. They are maintaining the traditions, that's what is being handing down, as I deliver them to you. Now, can you give me an example of one of those traditions that Paul delivered to them? Well, he gives himself an example later on in the chapter. Read here. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, sorry for the typo there, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. And almost word by word, we get the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper, as would be later, 10 or 15 years later, recorded by Luke. Now, that's interesting. Paul says, this is one of the traditions I taught you, and it is word by word a tradition that would later be written down in the Gospels. So the Gospels were not written down, but they were being taught by the Apostles and probably in a sort of similar verbal format as they would later be written down. And that is actually what the uh, Gospel writers say about their own word. John end of the Gospel of John. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. Now, he has seen it with his own eyes, etc., heard with his own ears, uh, and who has written these things. So this is a claim that the person who saw this and who undoubtedly has been teaching these very things for decades is now writing them down. How would you summarize what a gospel is? A gospel is not a biography of Jesus. A gospel is first uh, and foremost a record of the teaching of the apostles about Jesus. That is why the gospels have apostolic authority behind them. Not because they are a biography, but they are the way in which they taught the, uh, who Jesus was. And Luke says so much at the beginning of his gospel. Now, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things being accomplished among us. So Luke admits he's not the first one, but he says it's the narrative just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Think about that sentence. Luke claims that what he is writing down is not just in accord with what others have written down, but also as just as those apostles, that's a sort of summary term for uh, the ministers of the word and the eyewitnesses, just as the apostles have delivered to us. It is existing stuff that's been written down and Luke says, and I made an orderly account, and I sort of figured every, or uh, traced everything from the beginning. When somebody in the church would read Luke's gospel, he would not read anything new, but he would read the security of the things he had been taught already. And that is exactly the next verse, or uh, as Luke chapter 1, verse 4. So, uh, gospels are the uh, record of the teaching of the apostles all the time. And this uh, teaching is authoritative. Um, here we have 1 Timothy. Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. That's from, uh, from the law. And the laborer deserves his wages, which is a citation from Luke. And you only find this in Luke, not in Matthew, in these words. What can we conclude here? That what we have in Luke is called Scripture. 
It's placed on a par with the writings of the Old Testament. It is what the Holy Spirit says. Whether it is the Holy Spirit speaking through the words of David, or whether it is the Holy Spirit speaking through the apostles who had special authority in this sense. What is the other conclusion we can draw from this? Is that even during the time when the letters were being written, at least the Gospels were written down already too. Uh, and Paul says so much about the church. What is the foundation of the church? Okay. Jesus Christ, always the good answer. But in chapter 2, Paul says in Ephesians, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, what could he mean with that? Well, the apostles and prophets were the ones who brought the authoritative teaching that has, had to go to the church, well, in writing and in their preaching. And even the, in the end of the New Testament, when we see the new Jerusalem descending from heaven in Revelation, the wall of the, uh, of the new city has 12 foundations. And it is explained for us what those foundations are. They are the 12 apostles. The new city is built on the foundation laid by the apostles. So it is very important to keep that sequence in mind. Jesus teaching and preaching in actual reality. And then the apostles picking up that teaching, remembering it and teaching it everywhere. And then that teaching is written down in the form of the Gospels. Some of the apostles wrote it down themselves, others it was written down for them, and the apostles started to write letters. And there we have the full body of the apostolic uh, preaching. This simple model explains sort of historically how the New Testament came into being. It also very neatly explains the similarities between the Gospels and the differences between the Gospels. Uh, anyone who has ever taught something, the same material as someone else, will know that you tend to put your own emphases here and there. You tend to develop your own themes. You, you tend to you know, do, uh, do those things that, that reflect the things that are living in your own heart or you think your audience in particular needs. But at the same time, if you are following a set curriculum, there will be lots of differences or uh, similarities between them. Luke says that his gospel has three sources. One of them is what was written already. The second one is the teaching of the apostles, now just as they have delivered to us. And the third one is his own investigation after it. Now, lots of ink has been spilled and lots of pixels have been lit up on your computer screen, uh, all arguing about the synoptic problem. How do the Gospels relate to one another? Well, Scripture gives us the answer. It is a mix between the oral tradition everyone knew. It is between the individuality of each of the Apostles teaching the material. And there is also some literary relationship between them, because they were aware of one another. Now, can you untangle that sort of mix of influences? I've never seen a convincing untanglement that sort of can take account of the complexity of the situation. But what is important is that each of the Gospels has independent apostolic authority behind them. Matthew is not just a reworking of Mark plus something else. Or Luke is not completely dependent on other written sources whatsoever. That would do un injustice to what they claim to be and what history tells us to do. So how do we teach this in our churches. How does this help us 
in thinking about what the Gospels are and about the historicity of what we have. Well, first of all, um, we have in the Gospels the teaching of the historical event by eyewitnesses, then as recorded. That is important to keep. It is the teaching of the historical element, uh, yeah, of the historical events. Um, the second thing is, we have many who have undertaken to write the narrative, and we have the oral transmission of the thing. When Luke would come to a church and say, look, I have written a gospel here, and he would kind of give it, then most people in the church would go through it and, yes, yeah, that's how we teach it here as well, or yes, that's how Matthew taught it, and yes, we know this story already. The Gospels did not write something new to the churches, it was already known within it. No, the traditions as they had delivered them to the church. That was already there. And here we get that marvelous sort of uh, working together of living memory of the teaching of the apostles, and sometimes of the apostles themselves still being around, and the actual writing down. And they were happily living side by side for a time. Then the living memory dies out, and even the persons who have heard the apostles teach are dying out, or the persons who have, no persons who have heard the uh, apostles teach are dying out. And then we have a situation where we have just the manuscripts. But that initial stage of the New Testament has been guarded so well within the church by that sort of shared teaching, where the, the teaching happened in sort of no agreed wording in uh, Greek testimony, that we have a very secure historically ba uh, historical basis to accept the four Gospels as giving us the best possible windows into the teaching of Jesus. Thank you.